it's a difficult space to navigate. And what we've been trying to do at my firm, GSO, is make some of these products a little bit more accessible, and I'll walk you through one in particular that I like today. So that's a little bit about the alternative space. Let's shift gears now and talk about the global market outlook and where we see things going. So one of the things we do every day at GSO when we come into work is we ask ourselves, where is the market going from here? And I think many of you know the positives. You can read a lot about it. Interest rates are low. They're really low around the world, and we'll show you that. We've had a very accommodative Fed and a very accommodative ECB in Europe. We've seen an improving economy in the US and in Europe and record stock prices here in the US, but in many parts of the world. But as I thought about the headwinds up on the slide, I decided to go back and pull some old presentations after the crisis from 2009 and 2010. And I was surprised to see that a lot of the headwinds we're talking about today are the same things I was writing about and talking about in 2009 and 2010. Unemployment's down. I think yesterday they or Friday they announced it was down to just under 6%. But we still have a lot of people who are underemployed in jobs that are below their education or above, <laughs> below their skill level. We still have record deficits at the state level political system that I think most of you would agree, many believe is broken. In Europe, a lot of countries still very high unemployment, high debt to GDP. The European banks are very, very weak. We're still talking about problems in the Middle East, whether it be Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and now ISIS. We back then and today, we're talking about the strength of China and Brazil and Argentina and other problems in uh, emerging markets. And what it made me realize is a lot of the problems that we face globally, these are long-term problems. There is no simple solution. And because they're long-term in nature, all of us should expect that volatility will return to the markets. There will be times like 2013 where things just trended upwards, first half of 14, but I promise there will be times like the summer of 2011 when the US was downgraded, stocks fell 17%, or what we experienced in the last week or so, where volatility will return and assets will drop in price. So for the next 15 minutes, the one theme I want to stress is that now is a time for caution. So let's take a quick look. What I tried to do here was list some asset classes and show you what the <coughs> forecasted returns are in these asset classes. But I decided to look at a variety of different broker dealers and investment firms, what they were forecasting. So you can see JP Morgan is saying the five and 10 year treasury over the next few years. If you invest in those, you're gonna get negative returns. Barclays is saying if you go and buy a portfolio of high quality investment grade debt, negative returns. Credit Suisse is saying for high yield or senior secured loans, you should be able to make three to 6%. Goldman is saying in equities, they believe an equity portfolio over the next three to five years will generate about a 6% return, but they're also saying they expect somewhere between a 10 and 20% drawdown or decline in equities at some point. You can see where uh, what we're forecasting for some of our products, a venture and credit and direct lending. What I wanted to show you though down at the bottom is that low yields and low, low returns on assets is really a global phenomenon. When I go out and talk to CIOs around the world, they're all trying to figure out, how do I get more yield in my portfolio? If you look, you have something like Spain, their 10-year is yielding 2.23%. That's lower than the yield on the US 10-year. Yet in Spain, there's 25% unemployment. And you can see where the German 10-year is. So I put this in just because to I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, this is a graph of the Irish two-year treasury note, and I put it in through 2011. Does anyone anyone want to take a guess where it trades today? Well, I won't embarrass you, but here's what's happened to it since 2011. It got a lot worse, and today it's trading through treasuries and it's zero percent meaning people are willing to earn zero 
to buy just to park money in a two-year Irish treasury. And clearly, their economy is nowhere as good or robust as the U.S. market. This is a, also an interesting slide and raises some, lots of interesting questions. I put it in here because it actually keeps me quite humble because I started my career in 1984, right near the peak of rates. I have ridden the greatest bond bull market ever. I thank my father for saying, oh, you should try to get involved in the debt markets because it couldn't get better than this. I think the question for all of you in this room today is how do you make money in an environment where rates are going to go higher? Now, if you look in that little chart for 2013, you can see we got a little taste of that in 2013 when the second half of the year when rates went higher. I can tell you 99% of strategists for 2014 thought rates were moving higher. And as a general rule, when everybody thinks the market's going to do one thing, it does the opposite, and that's what happened. You can see your date, rates are down about 15, 20%. But they will go higher. And the question is, how do you make money in this environment? So my first recommendation for today, avoid the high yield market. Yields are decent, six, six and a half percent. But if you take a look at this chart, especially on the right, what this will show you is we've had a record amount of issuance in the high yield market. Now, the reason I bring this up is I don't like the quality of deals that I'm seeing come to market this late in the cycle. So what do I mean by that? So this is kind of an interesting chart. Focus on the first box, 2004 to 2007. What this chart shows you is the amount, or we're trying to show, the amount of triple C issuance. For those of you who don't follow the bond market closely, triple C's are the riskiest debt that can come to market. And if you look in that period from 04 to 07, you can see 136 billion of triple C's came to market. And this got a lot of press in 07 because at that, in that year, it was almost 37% of all issuance. So the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, lots of press on it. But take a look at what's come to market in this part of the cycle, the last four and a half years. Almost 300 billion triple C's, 100% increase. And that causes me a lot of concern. And this is probably way more than any of you want to know. <coughs> Excuse me. But this is a study by a professor at NYU who shows the performance of triple C's and what it's meant to show you with that little arrow is, over a 40-year period, if you were to look at it, about a third of all triple C's default within three years. Now, there's a lot of liquidity in the system. This is a different time. But everything will revert back to the mean. And so today, one of my messages is, don't get tempted by high-yield funds. Now, I have to tell you, I, I felt like I had to comment on equities just for a moment. Um, and I promise I will get to some things that I do like. Um, I am not an equity expert. I am a credit expert. Uh, but I wanted just to give you a little perspective on equities. So this slide just shows you, I think most of you know, equities are trading near their all, are actually at their all-time highs. If you look at this chart, what it shows you, this is from Goldman Sachs, is that if you look at PE ratios, which is one of the ways we measure the market, um, this says that the market's trading, if you look at that trend line, that blue line, light blue line, we're trading kind of in line with historical averages, which I think makes sense. However, I'm starting to see some signs in the marketplace that make me worry, especially when it comes to anything that involves technology. So I'm going to give you two examples, but I could give you probably 200 examples. First one I wanted to mention is Tesla Motors. Um, I don't own a uh, Tesla, I've never driven in one, but I know some people who have one and they say it's a great car. It's certainly a great looking car. But what I wanted to do is show you where Tesla Motors is trading versus General Motors. So if you go down about five lines down to total car sales, you can see that GM sold last year 6.4 million cars. And Tesla sold 21,000. So GM sold 300 times the amount of cars as Tesla. 
In addition, if you go to the bottom, you look at their net income, you can see GM's net income is 5.3 billion, and Tesla's was 74 million. So our net income at GM was 70 times greater. And yet, if you go up and you look at the two market caps, you can see that GM is trading at barely twice the value. Seems to me very illogical, and yet the stock does not go down, and uh, I wouldn't want to make a bet against it because for some reason people are very, very excited about it. The other one I wanted to mention is a uh, company called Twitter. Now, I don't know if any of you in this room have used Twitter. I will admit I have never used it, but my kids seem to like it quite a bit. However, if you take a look at the numbers in that little box, um, you can see that last year Twitter made about a billion and they lost in net income almost a billion. So take a look on the left hand side starting in October. In October, the company went out with a roadshow and even though they were losing a billion dollars a year, we're going to get a $10 billion valuation. That seems very high to me. Two weeks later, they finished the roadshow, and you can see they go public at $14.4 billion. A day later, the market trades the stock up 73% to a $25 billion valuation. And then, about a month later in December, the stock trades to 73, and it has a market cap almost the same as GM. So, these are signs that make me a little bit worried. I'm not saying people should get out of equities, but it's something to keep in mind. When you start seeing values like this, these are red flags. So what is it I do like? First of all, um, one of my favorite fixed income asset classes is senior secured floating rate bank loans. These are secured loans that a bank makes to a company you're secured by assets, and then the banks syndicate them, and they trade fairly actively. Now, one of our concerns, obviously, as fixed income investors, is what happens to our bonds as, as rates go higher. And I think 1994 is a great year to focus on on this chart. In 1994, the Fed made eight successive interest rate increases. They were caught off guard. GDP was much greater than they were expecting. And rates went up a lot. You can see the 10-year widened out by 250 basis points. Look at the performance of various asset classes. That investment-grade portfolio or high-grade bonds had negative returns. A high-yield <coughs> portfolio was relatively flat. But senior secured loans generated about a 13% return. I think this is a great place for you, your children, your parents to hide out. If you talk to your brokers, PIMCO, Eaton Vance, Fidelity, BlackRock, there are probably 50 different firms that are involved in this. My only caveat would be you want to be in a fund that doesn't reach for yield. This is the time to invest in a conservatively managed fund. The other area that I wanted to mention that I really like is what we call direct lending. Now, this is one of our big alternative strategies, and again, Direct lending for us is where we come in and we act like a bank and we make loans to companies. Sometimes they're secure, sometimes they're unsecured. We make loans to companies that the banks don't want to make and we get paid a very large premium for making those loans. I think the next slide is the best way to look at it. Um, this gives you an idea of the yields we can earn. We earn a coupon of 8 to 10%. We get fees which go to our investors, we get call premiums, and you can see on average what we're trying to make is 500 to 1,000 basis point premium over what you could get in the high yield market. What's most important to us in any well-managed direct lending fund is we focus a lot on downside protection. We're really focused that if things go wrong, making sure we get back our capital. So let me give you an example of the type of thing we do. This is a company called Giant Cement. Now, Giant Cement, if you look down next to those little upside down uh, triangles, is actually a company 
that is controlled by a Spanish company called Grupo Cementos Portland Valdietas. Now, none of you would have heard of this company. We have a large European business, and this company in Spain was going through a difficult period. And they came to us and they asked us, could we help them refinance some of their debt? When we looked at it, we weren't really interested in financing the Spanish business, but they owned a lot of really good cement facilities up and down the East Coast, and actually one of their biggest facilities is in Harleyville, South Carolina. And you can see, after we did our work, we were able to come and make a senior secured loan to the company, where we earned a 10% coupon, and we got a kicker where we take a piece of their cash flow after they pay their corporate overhead, where we think we can make a 12 to 15%, but we're senior secure, and we think our downside is really limited. So again, this is an interesting area. It would be hard for any of you to come and play in our institutional funds, but there is something in the marketplace called a BDC, a Business Development Corp. This was something that was created by Congress to enable middle market companies to get private funding. There are probably about 20 to 30 of these BDCs that trade. Most of them have yields today between 8 and 11 percent. And again, this is something if you're interested you can talk to your brokers about, but I think it makes a lot of sense for a portfolio today. So just to wrap up, and I think I stayed within my uh, time limit, just to hit a couple points here. One, um, now is the time for caution. And while it doesn't feel this way, I feel pretty strongly that volatility is going to come back into this market in a meaningful way in the next 12 to 36 months. I think the credit markets will continue to do relatively well over the next year, but I think rising rates will have a material impact. And I think the place to hide out as rates go higher is in that senior secured floating rate bank debt. I really like direct lending. And then most importantly, this is a term I heard from, uh, well, I saw in the Wall Street Journal, WWYD. That stands for, what will Yellen do? And obviously, Yellen will play a really important role in the markets over the next couple of years. Let's face it, the Fed, by keeping rates low, has forced all of us to take a little more risk than we normally would. And we think Yellen will stay on the current course of maintaining low rates, trying to stimulate the economy and stimulate growth. But if the U.S. economy were to accelerate quickly or inflation were to go up sharply, Yellen could be forced to raise rates, just like we saw in 1994. It's not what we're forecasting, but it's something all of us should be aware for and try to be positioned for. So that wraps up my formal comments. Happy to answer any questions. I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thanks for inviting me. about super aggressive. I'm not opposed to that, but I'm not sure now is the right time for that. And let me ask you a question. I mentioned those BDCs. If you could go out today and just take your portfolio and make a 10% return and have minimal volatility, wouldn't that be enough? And why have that heartache of this super aggressive. So, and I'm not, this isn't to say that something like the marketplace won't take the BDCs and make them have some gyrations. But if you can find the right manager, and happy to help on that, um, you should get a, be able to get a portfolio that has minimal volatility and throws off a nice yield. And by the way, they pay those distributions quarterly. 
So I think for all of us in this room, it's just a very attractive way to play the market. Getting away from the individual stocks, I think has definitely been, been a strategy. Up to, to me, it makes sense into the different funds that blend the funds. So you have uh, that approach. Uh, do you, are there funds that do investing in this as part of their strategy in what you're talking about? Or is this a standalone investment strategy? In, in terms of the equity component? or yeah, Well, traditionally buying the AT&T or the, the Apple Pie stocks and, and having large uh, positions in those stocks, uh, that is a very scary thing after Mural Lynch and a lot of these, these yeah. companies just overnight. To diversify into funds, different uh, mutual funds, et cetera, that, that have a blended uh, exposure uh, where you know you can adjust real quickly and not into one stock. What I'm asking is your type of investment strategy can be part of that formula or does it need to be a standalone investment into that specific so, um, you know, what, what I do is I am focused 100% just on debt at GSO. Um, I do think you can find that, what you're looking for, avoiding those big concentrations in those bellwether stocks, um, or bonds for that matter. And they have a name, uh, it's called, uh, the only reason I know the name is because Bill Gross just went to Janus Fund and is starting a fund that's trying not to benchmark. And I think that's the key. The key is this. Most mutual funds, especially on the equity side, they are benchmarking versus an index. And so if the index has 2% weighting to AT&T, they're going to own 2% weighting because that way they're guaranteed to perform in line with the benchmark. But you as an investor, are you really, you're not that interested in how they do versus the benchmark. What you want is you want absolute return. You want to make sure that they're just trying to make money in all sorts of markets. And so they have names like Contrarian Funds. I, it's escaping me right now, but if you look for Janus, the new Bill Gross Fund, that's the type of fund that I would focus on in this environment today. Would you consider Wall Street friendly? I mean, uh, Wall Street friendly to your business, or specifically Senator Warren of Massachusetts? Has she created problems for your business? It's a good question. Um, the regulatory environment is, uh, has been a blessing and a curse. The bad part of the regulatory environment has been that they've come down so hard on the banks that the banks no longer want to commit capital to make markets in the types of securities we trade in. So it's made the fixed income markets very illiquid. On the other hand, the government, because of regulatory environment, it's made it much harder for banks to make loans. And so therefore, it's much easier for us to deploy our capital because it's gotten harder and harder for companies to get those loans. So it's a little bit of a mixed blessing for us, the regulatory environment. I think we have time for one more. Could you address uh, inflationary pressures in the intermediate term? It's a good question. And uh, you know, inflation is, uh, I think, is really the key. And it's a great question to end on as you think about the Fed and increasing rates. And I will tell you from what we see at Blackstone, we own about 70 companies. We employ close to a million people in those 70 companies. I get together on a monthly basis with the men, the, the folks who manage those businesses. And what we've seen is no inflation at all. And the most important component of inflation, I believe, for the Fed is wage inflation. And with unemployment coming down, you would think we would start to see it. There is zero signs of any wage inflation. So I'll just leave you with one last thought. It's my belief that the Fed, at the earliest, will start to increase rates, the middle of 2015. And they are going to be very, very small increases. 
And as you pick up the paper and you read about unemployment and all these stats, I think if you want to sense which way the market's going to go, really focus on wage inflation. Thanks again, everyone. Thank Doug, thank you for joining us today. You can take this as a small gift from us. Thank you so uh, appreciation much. Appreciation of your time. Appreciate it. Thank you to Adam and President Lad Mark for uh, organizing this program. I also want to thank Adam, Mark, and Bob. They do a lot of work behind the scenes on our educational foundation, uh, which ties into today's program. So thank you all for all you do behind the scenes. Uh, President Lad Mark, our next program? Sure. Uh, next week, we won't meet for the Columbus Day holiday, but on October 20th, we have uh, Congressman Joe Wilson. Okay, and that will be on October 20th. Next Monday is Columbus Day, so we will not meet. Barbecue tomorrow night with Robert Goings at the Siebel's house at 5.30. Uh, anyone who would like to stay afterwards, uh, you can see how in the back he has the new management from the baseball team. I believe they're going to be brainstorming teams called the Columbia Rotarians. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. <laughs> John. Quick comment. I hope everybody remembers the party tomorrow night is paid for. That costs you anything to go. It's a regular meeting meal, basically. So there's no reason not to show up. If you're in town and you'd be there at 5 30, it'll still be a lot of fun. Okay. So I hope you'll come. Great point, John. And then this is the meeting in place of next week's meeting, so it's already built into uh, the quarterly invoices that go out. So we hope to see you tomorrow night. Jim Smith will close us. Country is a thief. Thank you.